this is, this is actually something that every developer, if you're developing against SQL Server, um, having query plan reuse in mind when you develop is, is actually something that should be on your mind. Uh, it shouldn't drive you, you know, go to sleep or lose sleep over it or something like that. But uh, it is definitely something you should consider. We're going we're gonna to see why that is in a little bit. Uh, my name's Andrew Kelly. I'm a mentor with Solid Q. I'm a SQL Server MVP, been one for about, well, 14, 15 years, something like that. And uh, I specialize in performance tuning, scalability uh, with SQL Server. So it, what, what I'm going to be talking about here is something that I um, use every day. I, I, I practice this, I, uh, I teach this, I preach this, um, because you cannot get a, a very high volume database without plan reuse. <clears throat> Again, we'll, we'll talk about uh, why that is. I've got, I don't know, 20-something slides. I'm going to go through them kind of quick. I'm actually, I might even skip a couple um, we, on purpose on that. We've got, only got an hour, and I've got a lot of demos, and the demos uh, go a long way towards uh, showing what it is that I want, the points I want to get across. But I left the slides in there so that you can go back later and you can look and you can get more detail in on that. So if I, if I gloss over a slide, don't worry about it. That's intentional on there. All right, so what is a query plan? Um, have, has anyone seen that, that kind of diagram? I mean, that's, that's from Management Studio. That's if you uh, hit Control L or hit the uh, estimated query plan button, you will see something similar to that. And that's a graphical representation of what SQL Server is going to do when you execute a query against uh, SQL Server. Well, I say query. It could be it's, it's virtually any statement that you're going to execute against SQL Server. I'm going to talk query mostly because uh, select statements are, are mainly where you're going to be optimizing your code and where you mainly want the plan reuse. But it's, uh, it's a set of steps that tells SQL Server how to go about doing that uh, operation. And it, uh, it goes right to left and, and top to bottom. And it, is, uh, it can be very simple. It can actually be so simple that SQL Server will generate a plan called a trivial plan but it doesn't even bother to store that plan because it's so easy, so trivial to recreate that it's not worth the extra overhead to kind of keep it and try to reuse it. And that's what's called a trivial plan. And uh, those, those tend to just get kind of thrown away and it'll, and it'll, uh, it'll recreate that very easily. Anyone think of an example of what a trivial plan might be? Select star from table, exactly. There's really only one way. Well, it'll look at the table. If the table has a clustered index, it'll scan the clustered index. If the table does not have a clustered index, it's a heap, and it'll scan the heap. That's it. That's, that's really its only choice, and that's not that hard to figure out. So it just throws that plan away. However, if it's kind of anything beyond that, uh, it can get quite complicated, and uh, especially if you have lots and lots of different objects you're talking about, tables, indexes, functions, views, the, the whole nine yards. And it gets uh, very quickly, it can get uh, very time consuming, very CPU intensive to come up with this plan. So if we, if we look at something like this, this is uh, basically joining three tables together. It's going to join this uh, first table. Uh, it, well, it's going to do an index scan on this index. And then it's going to go over and do what's called a nested loop lookup using another index. So it's going to take the outer row of one table and then it's going to use an index and do a, a search or a seek on the other table to find the, the matching row. And then it's going to uh, take that row and move on to the next operator. And then it's actually going to do an, uh, the same kind of thing again. But uh, now when it gets to this other operator, it's doing a nested loop join, but it's coming down against the table that has no index. And it's, or it, it, has, uh, it has no indexes at all. It's a heap. And we can tell that because it says it's doing a table scan. Meaning that if this table was 10 million rows and we only wanted one row, it has no choice but to read all 10 million rows because it's doing that full table scan. And it's going to do that once for every row that's coming across in that outer uh, loop. If we have uh, three tables and we're going to join A, B, and C, well, how's SQL Server going to do that? It uses a number of... Uh, uh, ways to figure out what the best approach is on that. Mainly, it's, it looks up in the metadata and says, okay, here's my, th here's my three tables I'm going to join, and here's a list of all the indexes on each of those tables. And then it looks at the uh, query, especially the where clause, and says, okay, well, how am I going to be searching for this? And then it tries to figure out which of those indexes are best to use for this, for this operation. And it has to uh, take into account things like, well, which tables am I going to join first? Because I said select, uh, 
I'm joining A, B, and C, there's nothing by default that tells SQL Server it can join A and C and then go back and join B, or do B and C and then join A. Just because you wrote it A, B, and C, um, that means nothing really on that. So SQL Server has to try and figure out which is the best because it might be that it joining B and C first and then taking that intermediate result set and then joining with uh, A is the better option instead of going A and B and then, and then C. Now, think if we had 10 tables and uh, other, uh, each table had many indexes and things like that. The number of iterations that it could go through to try and figure out what's the best plan can, can get uh, very, very uh, large right off the bat. It, can, it basically becomes exponential as you add objects into this. So you can have a situation with just a, uh, a four or five table join with a bunch of indexes and such that it could potentially be looking at tens of thousands of different ways to run that query. And it's got to figure out what the best way to do that. Well, that's what a query plan is all about. The query plan is that, that heavy hitting operation that happens the first time you run a query that tries to figure out which way we're going to join this table or which way we're going to attack this, whether it's a join, you know, whatever the operation is, and, and insert, update, delete, it has to figure out the best way to do it. Now, you might think that's not a big deal, but I can tell you from experience that can be a very big deal. I have seen large computers, large multiprocessor computers, taken to their knees because of uh, poor plan reuse on this, P uh, plan generation. I had a, uh, I had a client who, <laughs> when, it, when I came there, he wanted me to optimize this, this select statement. Well, the select statement had, I don't know, he was joining eight or 10 views, and each of those views was joining other views. And he had, uh, he was a C++ uh, um, programmer in his former life, and he loved the idea of using functions. And so he created uh, hundreds of user-defined functions in SQL Server, and he wrapped them into all these views that were calling all these functions in this. Well, I couldn't even get SQL Server to generate a query plan in the timeout period, and at the time, that version of SQL Server and that tool, I think the timeout period was five minutes. So it was sitting there for five minutes trying to come up with the best way to attack this, and then it would time out and wouldn't even come up with a plan. So you couldn't even run this on there. Now that's extreme. It's, it's real life, but it is extreme. But let's say uh, we got something that's not so extreme, but is more, more and more common. Let's just say it took two seconds to, to generate that plan. Okay, if you wanted to run that operation, a thousand times a second, and each time you ran it, it was going to take two seconds to figure out how to run it. Well, you're not going to get a thousand times a second because it's going to spend two seconds each time you run it just figuring that out if it's not getting plan reuse. So the whole idea of plan reuse is we do that heavy hitting operation once up front, and then the next time we call that, we don't have to figure out what the best way to do it is. We just got to go look it up in the cache and say, is this plan already in the cache? Yes, run it just like it is, use different uh, parameters and different values and such, but it runs the plan that we generated previously. Is that always the best plan for that? Not necessarily, that's a different thing that we'll touch on at the end there. But what we've done is we've taken out of the equation all that heavy hitting work that happened up front and in, in my example, it took two seconds. Well, if we took two seconds the first time we called it, and then for the next five days, it reused that same plan, then, and we called it a million times, the only time it took is the actual time to execute that statement, not that two second hit each time. And that's, that's why plan reuse is so important, because you're never gonna get the scalability that, you're gonna, that you may need without plan reuse. It's just, it's, it's an impossibility. You're, it's never going to scale to a large extent. And how, how large that is really depends on what it is that you're doing. It might not be that you're doing that many operations per second. I've worked on a lot of systems that will do between 50 and 100,000 transactions per second or batch requests per second. And you're not going to get that without, without plan reuse. It's just not going to happen. But I was uh, doing a, um, a proof of concept at, a, at the Microsoft um, MTC a couple years back, and this <laughs> they they brought in this uh, application that had web pages, and they were they just wanted to start testing this stuff right off the bat. Everything was ad hoc SQL, 
nothing, no, no performance was thought into, taken into account in any of this stuff. And they just said, let's start with the login page. And they started logging in, you know, sending in a, a, a login request with a login and a password. And then they would look up some information and then they ret return, say yes or no. As soon as they started hitting these things, the CPU, this was, this was a few years ago, and, and the system was an eight processor system. And all of a sudden, that system went to 100% CPU right, right across the board. And they were getting about six to eight logins per second out of, out of this application. And I took a look at it, and it was the, the, whole, uh, the whole reason it was doing that is because when you execute a statement the very first time, SQL Server needs to, or any time, uh, let, me, let me correct that, any time, SQL Server needs to figure out, is there already a plan? And how it does that is it goes and looks in the cache. It's a section of memory that holds the previously generated query plans, and it has to go through this process of finding them. With an ad hoc SQL statement, meaning that it was just, you know, select star from customer where ID equals one, that was generated in the client, sent in just like that, then the only way that it can really tell if that's in there is it generates a hash on that string, and when, when the plan gets put in the cache, it gets put into a hash bucket. And it says, okay, this bucket is for these hash values between this and this, this and this, this and this. So it's a typical hashing uh, process. So when you run the query, it, it finds the hash and says, which bucket is it in? So if I have, say, 300 buckets and I've got 10,000 queries or 10,000 plans, well, it'll put me into the right bucket. So it, it eliminates, you know, 299 of those buckets right off the bat. But then within that bucket, it has to do a character-by-character uh, string compare. It starts at the first character and says, is it S? Is it S? Is it E? Is it E? And it's case um, sensitive. Now, regardless of what your collation of SQL Server is, it's always case sensitive and it's space sensitive. So if you wrote one with a capital S and somebody else wrote the exact same one with a lowercase, it's two different plans. But the thing is, it has to go through and check all those characters. And in this case, they were, they were running the same operation uh, over and over again, the only thing they were changing was the login or the password value that they were passing. They were actually using the same login. So it said select whatever from table where the login equals such and such and the password equals such and such. So it was at the very end when that string was different. So it had to go in there and all those strings fell into the same hash bucket. So very, very quickly there was tens of thousands of these in that hash bucket. And then it's doing the character by character string compare, and it got to the gets all the way to the end and says there's no match, and then it has to go generate a query plan. The reason there was no match is because in their test they were generating a random value and it was never repeating, but every time they would submit it, it would get a plan and go in the cache. So the next one and the next one, the next one just built up those numbers, and eventually it took. Um, not only did it take seconds to look up to see if these things were in the cache but it took lots of CPU cycles to do the lookup, and then it had to come up with a plan on top of that. So uh, every time on there, and it quickly just overwhelmed the system. The only thing I did to fix that was put a, uh, a uh, create a store procedure and took that same call and put it into a store procedure. And the store procedure always reuses a plan. So it created that plan once, and, it, and then when it looks it up in the cache with a store procedure, it's got an actual object ID. It's a database, it, it's an actual object in a database, so it's got database ID, object ID. It doesn't have to go through the whole hashing thing. It's got an ID, it looks it up, and it finds it. And then it reuses the plan. So it's basically a simple, like very, two, very small two-step operation. Whereas the ad hoc SQL is a very complex, very drawn out thing when you have lots of, of stuff. So I know I, I went through a whole, big deal there, but it's important to understand why this, why plan reuse is so important. A lot of people start out in development with databases that are what? In, in your development environment, what are your tables in your, in your databases? They're, they're basically empty, got a couple rows, maybe a couple hundred rows, things like that. Okay, not a big deal. You can probably do almost anything you want. When you put it into production, you get lots more data but what else do you usually get that you don't get in, in development? Lots more users. You've got lots more people all trying to do this at the same time. And when you have to spend all your CPU uh, creating query plans and you've got hundreds or thousands of users trying to do this, it's a different story than in development. So if you don't plan on this initially, by the time you find out, your app is already in production 
and people are, you say, okay, we got to change this. And then what, what's, what's the reaction going to be? <laughs> it's not going to be good because you're going to have to make some fairly uh, fundamental changes to fix those problems. Whereas if you just thought about that up front or plan for it up front, it'd be a non-issue and you know, everything, you'd be a hero, everything would be, be great on there. Oh, that was the blackout button. That was the wrong one. So anyway, these things, the, the plan, that's just a graphical representation, but it shows you, or it gives you an idea of what SQL Server is trying to figure out when it's generating these plans and why these plans exist in the first place. Uh, what gets its own plan? Well, SQL Server has a number of different things. A batch is anything that you send to SQL Server. It, it, could, be a, it could be a store procedure. Uh, it could be a single select statement. It could, be, it could be 100 select statements. As long as it's all sent at once and there's no goes in between, that's one batch. If you had 100 statements and you had 10 goes, that'd be 10 batches on there. But each batch gets its own plan. Any store procedure gets its own plan. So if you, out of that 100, um, if some of those were stored procedure calls, you'd get the batch plans and then you get plans for the individual store procedures. And the same is true for the triggers. Um, they get their own plans as well. So when you hit the tables, they'll get their plans. And then dynamic SQL, whether you're using exec SQL or SP execute SQL, and we'll talk more about SP execute SQL in, in more depth in a little bit. And then some individual statements. And what I mean by that is that it used to be that if we had, uh, say, a store procedure and it was a very complex one, it had 500 lines of code, when, when you first submit it, SQL Server generates a plan, and it generates a plan of action for every line. That every line may never get executed, but it has to come up with a plan on in case it does. So it'll come up with a plan for those 500 lines in there. And um, you might have a situation where one line is forcing that store procedure to be recompiled each time you call it. And you're not getting the benefit of plan reuse anymore because the way it used to be is that one line would force all 500 lines to be recompiled. Well, as of SQL 2005 and greater, uh, they changed that and they can actually pull out one or more lines of code that are forcing recompiles, give it its own plan. So then you'll have the majority of the, the batch or the procedure or whatever will have the plan and it'll stay intact. And then even if this one gets recompiled, it's only talking one or two lines. So it's, it's gotten a lot better at dealing with that kind of thing. But uh, if you have to do the whole thing over every time, we get back to where we, were, where we were before. What good are the plans? Well, I've kind of been talking about that all along. It's uh, the plans allow for the plan reuse. I mean, the plan tells it what to do, but if it didn't store that plan, then it would have to come up with it every time on there. So that plan cache, or the, you, you'll hear it referred to as plan cache, and you'll hear it referred to as procedure cache. It's the same thing in, in SQL Server on there. Uh, this is basically everything that, uh, that I've been saying. Uh, essentially, you got a lot of work, or potentially a lot of work, every time you make a call to create a plan. You don't want to do that you, uh, each and every time. You want to do it once, and then you want to reuse it as you go along. The plans, is this a little fuzzy, or is it, is it my eye? No? OK, I guess it's just my bad eyes on there. Um, when, when you create a plan, it's kind of like a template. And uh, well, it is essentially it's a template. And then when you go to execute it, uh, the you get a copy of that template, and then you fill in the blanks. So in this case here, uh, the blanks would be parameters that you're passing in. If it was a store procedure, uh, it would you would reuse that template, but you would pass in different values for the store for the uh, parameters. And you have other things that are relevant for a given plan, like who the user was some ANSI set settings, some things like that. And those are basically all blanks in the parameter. So you use the guts of the, of the plan, uh, that, uh, and then you just fill in the blanks, and you can reuse all, all of that stuff. So it's, um, it, and it can make copies of it. If you have 10 people call it at the same time, it'll make 10 copies of that plan. And they all will execute their, on their own. And then as things die off and things get slow, it'll kind of eat them away, and then it can create more later if it wants to. So you don't have to worry about single execution, single thread execution on that. All right, so where do the plans live? Uh, I'm, not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna get you guys too deep into all this, especially I've got in my sample code, I've got a summary set of DMVs that kind of gets you all the information. But there are different dynamic management views that pull out the information for the plans. 
And uh, it, these are all memory resident things. Dynamic management views, or in the case of the, some of these, they're dynamic management functions, because you pass a, a parameter to it. Um, it goes and pulls the data out of memory and makes it look like a, a table, makes it look like a, a standard SQL Server result set. But these are all memory resident, um, uh, this is all memory resident data. And what does that mean? It's in memory, and, what, and what, what's, what's the downside of being in memory, memory resonant? It's not there forever. It's not there forever, right. It can get forced out from memory pressure, or if you reboot your server, your plans all go away, and you start from scratch again, you work your way up. Again, if you're getting good plan reuse, not a big deal, because you create it that once, and you just reuse it. So not a big deal, but um, it, it is all memory-based on there. How important is it? Well, when it comes to performance and scalability, uh, if you don't have the plan reuse, you're never going to get to the level that you want. If you, if, you know, and, and again, don't think about what you have now because everybody builds an application with this in mind and a year down the road, it's generally up here is where you're really at. So you want to look to make sure that you have the ability to get there, whether you think you're going to be there now or 10 years from now because it's harder to change it. Uh, this again, this is one of the slides that uh, uh, you guys can just take a look at. It tells you uh, the same with this one here. This is uh, basically tells you a little bit about how the plans stay in memory. And SQL Server is pretty smart about it in a nutshell. The harder the plan is to create and the, and the more often you use it, the more likely it is to stay in the cache on that. So if you, use, if you call a certain store procedure all the time, that plan is going to stay in cache even if you get memory pressure. But if you call it like once a day, it's very likely uh, by the end of the day they needed that memory for something else and they forced it out and you have to get it again on there. But it's, it's very smart about how it does that. All right, and again, I'm, I'm gonna show you uh, just a few things here first, very quickly, and then we are going to get into some more of the meat of it um, in a, in a uh, very quickly here. This is this is a summarized view or a uh, a small view of the cache, and it says the different types of objects in there. The ones that we're going to be most concerned with are the compiled plan and these ad hoc plans, the prepared and the ad hoc plans. And ad hoc means they were they were submitted as a in an ad hoc fashion. The the client application likely built that select statement. Um, on the fly and then just issued the statement. Didn't, didn't put it in a store procedure, didn't parameterize it, didn't do anything like that. Question? Where would entity framework fall into this category? Where would entity framework fall into this category? Well, the older ones uh, used to just do all ad hoc SQL. It was very, very bad about that. Um, any, uh, matter of fact, pretty much all those kinds of frameworks like that were just really bad at that. Uh, I forget what the other most common one is that was just horrible because everything was a dynamically generated string that got sent in with all the parameters hard coded and you got virtually no plan reuse out of that and we're going to see why that is. The newer one is a little bit better about treating some of that. It can use uh, SP Execute SQL, it can call store procedures. So you can still use the entity framework and, generate and use store procedures, which are going to give you the best plan reuse out of that. And again, we're going to see some of that in the, in the demos at the, at the end here. But it is, it is one of the problem childs. Any of those kind of frameworks are problem child. Okay. There's a command you'll see me use quite a bit called dbcc free proc cache. I don't recommend you run this on your own production server. Um, it, it clears out your procedure cache. It will wipe out any plans that are in your cache. Um, you're going to see me using a lot because it's good for demo purposes, but it's not necessarily good for production purposes. And then I'm going to be running a DMV that's very similar to this one. And uh, I'll explain a little bit about this. It uses the, uh, the dynamic management view exec cache plans. Make sure I got the right thing. This one here. And uh, that is materializing the plans that are stored in memory. It's going to materialize it and give us one row for every plan in the cache, basically. And then I'm cross-applying this dynamic management function called exec SQL text, and I'm passing it the plan handle, which is just a, uh, a hash value, just a, a GUID, basically. And uh, what it'll do is it'll go up and it'll look and find me the text associated with that. Because if I just call the cache plans, I get back certain information 
but I don't get back the string that was actually submitted or was used when I uh, run that statement or whatever. The SQL text gets me that, that text for that string and allows me to put it together. So by cross-applying it, I'm saying for every row in the plan cache, go get this text and, and add it as a column and make it look like it was there to, to begin with. And I've, I've got, uh, what I'm gonna be using from this point on is this summary here that is essentially the same statement, but I've filtered out certain things that uh, just, again, for demo purposes, it makes it a little bit easier because SQL Server and especially Management Studio is very bad <laughs> for uh, plan reuse. It, it generates a lot of garbage. Uh, you just click on a node or you open a window or whatever, and it's gonna create all kinds of ad hoc SQL statements that were never written for proper plan parameterization, and they're just going to cloud up the, our, our demo here. So I'm filtering out a bunch of things, but you'll see when we get in and actually look at the demo, the ones that we care about will be right there. But the, but the statement is, uh, the, you know, it's, it's the, um, it's, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, it's that one right there is, is what are going to be the things that, that we're most concerned about, and you'll see that in just a second here. If I run it now, there's there's only one plan in the cache. I, I ran DBCC free proc cache. I'll run it again, and then we'll look at that. Okay, so it's, it's clear in there, it's because I filtered it out. In reality, the statement that I just ran would have showed up in the cache, but I filtered it out with the where clause because even though I cleared the cache, it has to create the plan before it can run it. So it actually creates a plan, puts it in the cache, so by the time you go to look at it, it's already there on there. As the statement gets done, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but the plan gets generated the first time you run the statement, whether that's a store procedure, select statement, whatever. A myth is that it gets created at compile time. When you say actually create store proc or create function and you run that, a lot of people think that's when the plan gets generated, and it is not. It's only when you call that the first time. So I could have created it five days ago, but until I actually run it, there will be no plan in the cache on that. Okay, um, now the compiling, when, uh, this is what I was just talking about, when does a plan get compiled, and it's the first time you run it. And the, and the main reason for that is because the SQL Server can, can use a technique called parameter sniffing, and, it, and it's used mostly with store procedures. And what parameter sniffing is, is the ability to view the value that you're passing in as a parameter. If I just had a select statement and I said declare at city, and, uh, and then I assigned a value to it, and then I said select star from address where city equals that variable, SQL Server does not have a clue what that value is in that variable. So it takes a guess. When it's doing its plan uh, generation, it guesses based on the average statistics, <coughs> excuse me, meaning that for any given city, what is the average number of rows that will return for any given city value? And it knows what those are based on the statistics that it keeps, but it doesn't know what value that is. However, if we made that into a store procedure and we passed in the, the city as a parameter, and then we called that and we passed it in and we said Boston, it would then be able to see the value Boston. It would look up in the histogram and the statistics and say, well, Boston, there's roughly 322 rows for that. And it would base its plan on that value. And that's called parameter sniffing. So that's another good reason why you would want to use store procedures versus ad hoc uh, SQL on there. But that is, is one of the reasons why the plan gets generated then because it can take advantage of that. <coughs> Uh, so, and, and a recompile, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much, uh, let me see, put what's on there, but <clears throat> it used to be that once you created a plan, it would get, it would recompile all the time. There would be so many different things that would force it to recompile. It's, that's not so much, um, that, that's actually not the case these days. There are things that cause a plan to get recompiled, such as if you change the table or you know, if you add an index, drop an index on the table, add a column, um, change the data type, um, uh, modify the store procedure that is used in any of those, it will invalidate that plan in the cache because you made a change and it may now change that plan 
on there. So it will invalidate. That's called a recompile. That, a recompile is when it's already in the cache and then it got invalidated for some reason. That's not as much of a big deal as it used to be, but getting the plan reused in the first place, getting it to reuse that plan to begin with that's in the cache is the primary goal. Again, this is just for FYI, the same thing here. You can, if you have issues where you're getting lots of recompiles, you can identify that. There's with a trace or extended events, that list that I just showed will tell you the reason, like it, if it was um, statistics getting updated or whatever the case may be. If you get into that, you can, you can use that. <clears throat> uh, a good best practice, it, it, it does and doesn't have, I mean, it does have something to do with plan reuse, but if uh, anytime you call an object in SQL Server, you should always schema qualify it. So instead of saying select star from person, even if HR is your default schema, you want to say hr.person. Even if it's DBO, you want to say DBO. Dot. And that does have an, uh, an effect when it looks up the plan in the cache because by default, if you don't specify a schema, it's going to look at your default schema and, and it's going to go look for that. But if it really was DBO and not your default schema, then it's going to go through and look for yours and then it's going to go back and look for it again on the other way. So there are performance implications to that. But the general rule of thumb is always schema qualify your objects and then, um, and then you don't have to worry about any of that. Okay, so now we're getting to the real, the real meat of it and the more along the lines of what you guys probably are looking for. There's a number of different ways you can call SQL Server. And <clears throat> I'm gonna show you a little demo with a little .NET app that I wrote and uh, no, no critiquing on that because it was, um, it was one of my first ever .NET apps. <laughs> um, you can call it as a batch. Uh, any, again, I mentioned anytime you just submit a, a query or whatever to SQL Server, it's gonna come across as a batch. And this would typically be how if you're running Management Studio, SQL Server Management Studio, anything that you execute in Management Studio is gonna be a batch because that's the way that, that that's set up. Um, you can have uh, batches with ad hoc uh, parameter statements, and I'll show you a little bit more about what that means in a minute. Store procedure calls, and you can do an ad hoc store procedure call, which is the bad way to do it, meaning you're kind of running a store procedure just like it's a statement text, which is not the right way to do it. Or you can do what's called an RPC call, a remote procedure call. That's when you execute a store procedure the correct way, and it's a special protocol that SQL Server or the client uses to talk to SQL Server called RPC. And it's the most efficient way that you can talk from a client to SQL Server on that. So another reason why store procedures are always good to be your starting point. And then there's, uh, there's SPX or there's Dynamic SQL or SP Execute SQL, uh, which is a compromise in some ways between store procedures and ad hoc SQL. It's actually, a compromise probably isn't the right way to say it. It's, it's a way to get plan reuse and get the performance that you're looking for, but still have the ability to dynamically generate the uh, statement in your client on that, or to, to come up with that statement on client. So it's a store procedure, it's stored in the database, and the client, uh, you, you can call it, but if you need to make a change, that changes in the, the database. Whereas in the client, if you're trying to build a statement on the fly based on a set of parameters that was on the website or whatever, you, you can't do that as easily with a store procedure. So you can use SP Execute SQL and you can get, still get plan reuse and have the ability to do the dynamic uh, part of it. So it's not an all or nothing thing like a lot of people think with the entity framework. You either use store procedures or you get all ad hoc. That's not, that's not the case. Most of the times with the modern the modern applications, uh, you can use SP Execute SQL and kind of get the best of both worlds. And again, I'll show you what that is here in just a second. Um, the, a batch would be just, just that. You're hard coding your, this is what most apps tend to do. They'll create that statement in the client um, on the fly and they'll hard code the value. So in this case, the where clause says where the, uh, where the order ID equals 11048, but it's hard coded into the statement. So when you, when you run that again with a different value like 11049, you're not necessarily going to get plan reuse because remember it looks at the entire string and that's now part of the string on there. And this is the most common way that people do it, but it's actually the worst way that you could, you could call SQL Server. You can get what's called auto-parameterization, meaning that SQL Server 
can look at a statement or look at a where clause and say, well, um, I think instead of order ID equals and hard coding a value, I can safely parameterize that and I'll, I'll declare a parameter, I'll declare a data type, and I'll assign that value to that, and then I'll call it and pass in that, that parameter. And that's called auto parameterization. And it would look um, something like this when, you, when it comes across. It will substitute the value for at P1 and it'll declare a, uh, a data type, et cetera. Thing is, you don't want to rely on auto parameterization because there's lots of things that can uh, kill that. And you'll see in the demo in just a second what I mean by that. Uh, batches, uh, ad hoc, or kind of ad hoc statements, but parameterizing the, the value. This is almost as good as SPX Qt SQL. Not quite, but almost as good. Where I am in my code, in my uh, client code, I'm actually declaring, uh, adding a parameter, telling it the data type, and then I'm setting the value to it, and then I'm executing it on that. So I am, I am calling this, and, and behind the scenes, what this is going to do is this is going to wrap this in a SP execute SQL call, which is a built-in store procedure in SQL Server meant for dynamically generated statements. But what SP execute SQL has over just the plain exec is it allows you to de define and declare and assign variables that you can then get plan reuse from that. So at the minimum, you can do this in your code and it will probably wrap it into an SP execute SQL call. And if it does that, then you're in pretty good shape. But uh, depending on what you're using for a client like Java, um, Java's not necessarily uh, a good player when it comes to something like that. Dot, .NET's a lot better. And, uh, and when you call it uh, the next time with a different value, you will get a parameterized uh, statement that, that probably will get reused on there. And then uh, I'm not even going to go with it. This is, this is executing a store procedure, but as a statement. You, you really don't want to do that. For this, this is saying that the command type is text. So I'm saying exec dbo dot, you know, my store procedure and passing in the variables. You don't want to do that. You want to call it as an RPC. So your command type is going to be store procedure, not text. And then you de decline, uh, decline, define the, the parameters and the data types and such. And then everything just works the way it should on there. All right, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and look, at, uh, look at some of the demos. I'm not going to go over this now just because there, there's not enough time. But you can do certain things to uh, affect the plan reuse, how you can get better reuse. Or in some cases, I was telling you about that parameter sniffing. Sometimes parameter sniffing is not a good thing because you might get the wrong plan based on the value that you're passing in. So if you had a situation where 50% of the time uh, scan is the right thing, and 50% um, uh, seek is the right thing. But if you just uh, if you just let the uh, and it's a store procedure, if you just call it normally, it'll get a plan based on that value passed in the first time. It would be appropriate for whatever value you passed in, but then 50% of the time it's going to be inappropriate. So you could say, for instance, uh, uh, recompile, and every time you call that store proc, it would generate a new plan. Now that's not you know, you don't want to do that with everything, obviously. But there, there are hints and stuff that you can use to kind of tweak these rules some. All right, so let's, and there's just some links in there. So that's all the slides. All right, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you uh, a few statements and how, they, and how they will come across and how they'll look. This is just some cleanup code. Just setting the database the right way, clearing the cache. Then I'm going to run three statements. They're all the same, except they have a different value in the where clause. If I run this, and then we go look at the plan cache, and we look at that, we see three different plans. So what this is telling me is that each row in here, you see the different values. And this use counts, the use counts is how many times it used or reused that. So if I call that exact same statement again, so if I go back up to, up to here, and I just run these two, and then we look at the plan cache, we see that those two have a value, a use count of two, and the other one only has a use count of one. But 
every time I pass in a different value for the, for the where clause, it's going to get its own new plan. Okay, that is pure and simple, that's lack of plan reuse. If you had an application and you were calling this 100 times a minute and you passed in a different value each time, very shortly you'd have tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of entries in your cache. It depends on if you've you got enough memory to, to store all that. And it will, um, it will not be good because when you call it, it is going to have to do that thing where it's going to look up in the hash bucket and then go do the string by string, character by character compare. Not what you want on there. And it's a pretty simple statement, right? I mean, you can't get any simpler than that. However, to show you just, just how um, bad it could be if you, if you want, I can go over and run a similar statement. Anybody tell me what the difference between this one is and the other ones? It's uh, this one, the, uh, actually, let me scoot this over. The only difference really on this is, was the data type for the where clause. The other was a string. This is an integer, or it's a numeric type. Strings, by default, do not get auto-parameterized. Okay, so as soon as you have a, um, as soon as you have a join, an aggregate, a string in your where clause, anything like that, auto-parameterization goes out the window, by default, on there. So auto-parameterization is not anything you should ever rely on. And even in this case here, where I called it and I got, I got auto-parameterization, and basically it's, it's putting in, still putting in an entry in my plan cache, 16,000 bytes, but this is the actual plan that it, that it generated from that, 65,000 uh, um, bytes that is in there. And every time I call it, I'm going to get another one, and another one, and another one, another one, and it's just going to be taking up memory in my cache, and it's not doing me anything uh, for that. I'm not getting the, the, the reuse that I, that I want from that. And, and it, uh, it makes certain assumptions. You notice that before, it said it was a, uh, a small integer. If I call that same statement again with a, with a bigger value, we see that we now have two of the plans because one is a small int and one is an int. It takes liberties because it's just got a guess. All it sees is a number coming across and takes a, takes a guess. And it would be the same with var cars, with uh, characters and uh, variable length. It's going to take a guess and it can, you could have multiple plans. So again, not a good thing. You don't want to leave it up to SQL Server to do those, do those kinds of things. You, you can, uh, I mentioned before, any aggregate um, any join, anything like that, makes that go out the window by default. However, you, you can set a database setting called set parameterization forced. I'm going to turn it on, and I'll come back, and we'll look at, the, at these here. Uh, that I might have had an extra space in there, which I did. Um, but now I get auto-parameterization for that. There's a database setting called force, uh, by default it's simple. It's called auto-parameterization. It's uh, simple or forced. If you have a situation where you've got an application that you can't change right away, try turning this, um, and you're not getting plan reuse, try turning this database setting to forced, and it goes a little bit deeper, and if it can get the plan reuse, you'll see increased performance. If, you, if it does all this extra work and then it's still not able to get you the extra reuse, you're going to see decreased performance. So you turn it on, see if things got better. If not, you turn it off. <laughs> and and you've got to keep an eye on it after a while. So it's not a, it's not a solution, really, in the long run. It's a, um, it, it's, it's a way to kind of get by for a little while. Now I'm going to go, I'm going to show you uh, store procedures. Well, actually, I'll look at, uh, we'll, we'll look at SP Execute SQL. If, if I do Dynamic SQL, I, I'm not even sure if you guys are familiar with this version of Dynamic SQL. We just take in a string, concatenate it together, and then we say exec that string. And a lot of people think you cannot get plan reuse with that. But if we execute that, and then we take a look at, oh, I don't want that. Okay, what did I do? Let me, let me go back, because I'm not sure what I hit there. <laughs> I might have, I, I added a, uh, oh, oh, that's why. <laughs> I'm like, that should work. 
Okay. There we go. Okay, because that's a string, I'm not getting I'm not getting my uh, plan reuse on that. But if I if I used uh, SP execute SQL, which is harder to write, but you have much better benefits. And essentially, it's SP execute SQL. You give it a uh, a variable or you give it a, a string that has the body of the text in it. And in that body of the text, which is defined up here, you're actually specifying a variable. So I say where the city equals at city. Then I'm declaring a parameter definition, calling it at city, saying it's a var car 30, and then I'm setting the value. And then when I execute it, SP execute SQL, I give it the, the body, the parameter definition, and then the actual parameter values. And I execute it. And when I do that, let me make sure I get all the right. This is a little difficult to kind of hold on here. It's on such an angle, I can't hold, I can't let the mouse go. <laughs> So if we look at the cache, and I don't know if I cleared it first, but we see now we actually got uh, plan reuse from that. And this is, this is what you'll see here in just a second again with when we look at the calls from, from .NET on there. But that's what we're after. If we are going to have to, in our application, we're going to have to generate this stuff dynamically, we want to either use store procedure, well, we're going to generate dynamically, we probably can't use the store procedure, but we want to get plan reuse, so we want to try to get um, SP execute SQL to, to come into play here. I'm going to show you, uh, anybody familiar with Profiler? It's actually getting, uh, it is discontinued um, in the, the next release of SQL Server, but uh, it's good for this demo purpose, and basically it's going to show me what I'm calling into SQL Server. So I'm going to look at that. I'm going to clear out my cache, and then I've got a I've got a little uh, .NET app that I wrote. And again, no no comments on. <laughs> and it's essentially it's just going to show me uh, if if I'm going to execute this, and and I execute that, what it comes across as for SQL Server is exactly what we passed in that hard-coded value. And it got sent across as a batch completed event. Batch completed means um, it was just an ad hoc batch. What we're looking for is RPC completed, that, that special call when we call a store procedure. And SP execute SQL is a store procedure. So if we go back over, let me move this all the way over here. Um, so if I sent in a uh, um, one like this, I could potentially get plan reuse, or I could get uh, auto parameterization out of that. So if I execute it, we see that this is what it came across. It just looks like the statement that we called it. But if we look at in the cache itself, it was parameterized it was uh, auto-parameterized. So we just called it, and, and the driver figured out, I can safely do that. But that's, that's not something we can depend on. So even if you see that happening, kind of ignore it. Really where you want to go, if you, can, if you can call a store procedure, and uh, this, is, uh, this is us calling a store procedure. Let's actually clear the cache here. We execute that, and don't worry about what, what values come back. We look in, in the, the cache here, and we see it. This is the, it, it gives us a create procedure syntax. It's not the execute of that. We're executing that syntax that created that store procedure. So every t it's a little confusing. Every time you call it, you're going to see the create procedure. You're not recreating that every time. That's just the original syntax that was used. Same with functions and views and things like that. But if I come back over and I call that, uh, two or three or four more times, and then we look at this, what do we get? We get our use counts is there. We did not get a different plan for each time we called it. If I called it with a different value, which is this, and we look at the cache, we still get one plan on there. And if we look at um, Profiler, we see this is how it's coming across, RPC completed. And we are, that's our store procedure and the values. And the one down below that I just called is a different value. But we're getting the same plan. Now, the, the 
part that you're probably most interested in, because how many people are using all store procedures in their apps these days? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, but you, you're going to find very few people that are doing all store procedures. Um, that's something I think that you should try for first because there's a lot of advantages for doing that. And then all of this stuff we're talking about here kind of just goes away. It happens naturally. Um, but it does make the app a little bit more difficult uh, to write on there. So, Entity framework, yes, yes. And you can do it. So what we're looking at is something like this. So if I look at this statement here, I have um, th the statement is select star from, uh, it's, it's another table that I have, where the city equals at city. In the .NET code, and I, I don't have the parameters on here, but in the .NET code, I've actually created the statement, defined the parameter as a, uh, in this case, as an n varcar uh, 40, I'm sorry, n varcar 30. And I've set the value that I'm looking for to that uh, parameter, and I'm going to call it that way. So when we execute it, this is what we're going to get. So it comes across as an RPC completed, but look at the actual syntax. It's doing SP execute SQL. I didn't call SP execute SQL. I called select star from whatever. But because I went ahead and defined that as an actual parameter inside my .NET, uh, inside my command object, it automatically used SP execute SQL. So it's very easy for you to take and um, generate the code that you need to based on whatever conditions that you are come up in the app, generate that string, but parameterize it because you know what's the where clause and you should have enough uh, insight to know what the data types are. If you're going to build a where clause based on columns in a table, then you know what those columns in the table are. They're a, an int, they're a varchar 20 or whatever. And then you define your parameters accordingly. So you basically build a table or a, a matrix inside your code. And if you're going to dynamically generate this, you just pull out the pieces you need, you build the string, and then you execute it, and it will use SP execute SQL. You could also say, I'm just going to call SP execute SQL myself, and you build it just like that example I showed you before. That's up to you, however, which way you want to do it. But using the .NET um, framework, all you have to do is define the parameter types, set those values, and it's going to do that uh, SP execute SQL for you. Now, one, the reason why I have this last piece here is that uh, if we look at one little piece of this. I'm actually going to call this, this twice. One of them is defined with an, a var car 30. The other is an n var car 30. And if we look at the application in Profiler, we see that they're both calling. Um, what's going on here? Okay, I, I, it was hanging there for some reason. But we see the first one, it's a varcar 30. And the second one, it's an n varcar 30. If we look at the reads, which are the, which is this column here, the reads are the number of pages that it had to go and read to satisfy that query. There's an index on that column on city. And it, there's only one row that matches that value. So the, the one that's the varcar, it only did nine reads. The NVAR card did 75 reads. Why the difference? Because the data type of that column is a VAR card. It's a non-Unicode data type. And if you call it with a Unicode data type, SQL Server cannot do an index seek. It can't use the B tree in the index and go right to that row. So it scanned the index. It's better than scanning the whole table, but it scanned the index from beginning to end to try and find that matching value. This is another one of the most common issues we see with applications written, because by default, almost every framework uses Unicode by default. Um, Java especially is a big thing. And Java is nice that it's got a, a parameter or a, an attribute or whatever you want to call it on the connection that you can say, send parameters as non-Unicode. By default, they're all Unicode. You just turn that off, set it to false, and now everything's non-Unicode. Or did I say that backwards <laughs> on there? But the point is, Look at your underlying tables. If it's a NVARCAR 30, your data type should say NVARCAR 30. 
If it's a big int, then it should be big int. Now, int, int small int, big int, uh, those are pretty good about doing uh, explicit conversions and still getting what you want. But going with a character value between a nvar car and a var car, that it cannot do that. And it will not use the index, even though one exists. So make sure if your underlying tables are non-unicode that your calls are using non-unicode data types on there. None. So we are um, almost almost uh, out of time. Got a, just a couple minutes. I got through all the things I wanted to show. There are some more demos in there if you guys want to play with that. There's again some more slides, but the, the in summary, when you're developing your application, think about plan reuse in mind. It's it's actually not that much more work to do the right things to make sure that you are going to get plan reuse. It is a little bit harder if you're not using store procedures. You've got to write a little bit more code. But it's, it's not that much more code within your framework if you can just set it up initially so that you build this thing correctly and execute it uh, with the parameters defined instead of just sending the, uh, the hard-coded values in as, as most applications do these days. And you will be surprised at, um, at how much of a difference that can make if you're scaling. If you're, if you're only ever going to call one statement a sec or one statement, yeah, say a second, and you know that's it for the rest of that application's life. You, you might not see a difference. You might see a, wa a lot of wasted memory in your in your procedure cache that could be better utilized for other things, but um, you probably won't see the type of performance hit that you that you'll have if you're trying to do that call a hundred times a second, or five hundred or five thousand. If you don't have the plan reuse and you're trying to get thousands of executions per second. You're going, to have, you're going to have issues that are going to stem back to these kinds of uh, things that we talked about. All right, so uh, like I said, I just have a couple more minutes. So anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, so essentially, yeah, if, if that's, a, that's another common thing. If you have like a search engine and you've got a lot of different things that could be in your where clause, uh, some people will create this massive where clause where they'll say where this equals null or this equals one and they'll substitute something in there. The best way to, well, I shouldn't say the best way. The, the most common way to handle that and still get plan reuse and performance at the same time is to use SP execute SQL and then build that on the fly. So you, your where clause only includes the values that you're actually using. Now you may end up with a hundred different iterations of that. So you have a hundred plans, but when you call it the next time the same way, you'll get plan reuse. So uh, that's generally the best way to do it. And again, SP execute SQL is absolutely the best way to address that on there. Yeah, that's my experience too. Even if you have like three different options with seven different permutations, but each of those seven plans is very targeted and very. Yes. Targeted yeah. Which, I mean, it's almost what we're doing tonight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the more you put in there, the harder it is for it to get the, the proper plan on there. And any other questions? So yes. the Yes. Yeah, so the so the, the question is if, if you if you're using SPSQT SQL versus an actual store procedure, um, you're, you're, they're both coming across as RPC calls. Yes, the SPSQT SQL has a tiny bit of extra overhead because it's taking that dynamic SQL and turning it into it, but not not enough that it generally is worth you know having to to worry about it as much. So yes, if you can do SPSQT SQL um, and you do everything you want just fine then you don't necessarily have to worry about store procedure. But the advantages uh, store procedures go beyond that. So you can actually make changes to that code. Like if you made a change in the logic that returns those rows, you change it in the store procedure versus having to change it in your application. So you got to look at those things as well. But, but uh, SPXQT SQL is, is just about as good as a store procedure performance wise. And plan reuse wise, absolutely is good on there. All right, I think, oh, one more? Just okay. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was sort of mentioned there already, but to, to go back to the SPS and the SQL, the .NET SQL client um, driver automatically, anytime you have a parameterized statement, will convert it to a SPS 
exactly. Yeah, that's, and that's what I was showing with those last ones there. Yeah. So as long as you define that, that parameter, um, it, it will use SPSQ SQL for that. And it's very good. It didn't always do that, uh, but it does now. It's on there. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>